All right. Uh, it is Comp 123 in the summer 2016 semester. Um, we are programming two, right? Comp 123. Uh, lesson one, part one of our broadcast uh, today. And my name is Tom. I'm your professor for this semester. Um, you won't be switching professors with my with me in my class. I'll be the only professor that you'll be dealing with the whole 14 weeks, right? So that's the advantage of being with me. Um, although, you know what? If, who, I know some people had Professor Narendra in part one. He had Professor Narendra part one, right? He's pretty awesome, right? Like he's, he explains things well. He's very you know, patient and so on. Uh, I try and mimic him. I'm not him. Right? I try and mimic some of the stuff he does. But uh, C Sharp, I would say, is one of my favorite languages um, because it's very straightforward. I like it more than Java, right? Java's good, but it makes a lot more money. Java, if you want to make money, Java's the way to go, right? But C Sharp is really cool, easy to learn. And once you learn C Sharp and learning the web, JavaScript, if you're in my JavaScript course, that's Comp 125 um, that I have as well, then it becomes like, hey, man, if I know C Sharp, I kind of know JavaScript a little bit too, right? Actually, if you know Java, you know JavaScript a little bit too. Uh, some of the, the syntax is the same. So we're going to be doing C Sharp primarily in this course. That's number one, okay? Um, just bringing up our... Uh, the stuff that we're going to be doing in this course. I'm going to pull up the course outline, which is also up on Centennial right now uh, for you guys to look at. So here's your course outline. More or less, it's going to be the same as what you see here in terms of how, we, how we're how we going to do the you know the course, right? So just like I talked about uh, yesterday, for those people who had me in Comp 123, 125, right, um, is what we're going to be talking about today. One of the things to note is the book is this, and they talk about uh, Joyce Farrell, um, you know, 2013, uh, C-sharp for 2012, uh, for Visual Studio 2012. Guys and girls, um, it doesn't really matter because C-sharp hasn't changed all that much, right? There's some new changes to C-sharp that I'll be talking about uh, in the latest version of C-sharp that came out with ASP.NET uh, Core, right, that came out um, in Visual Studio 2015. I will be talking about those differences, but at the end of the day, it's almost exactly the same. So there's not a lot of difference here. That's why the book is still good. Um, there's no issues with this one. It's a good book. It's some. It's uh, It's got some um, a good reference to use, and um, as you know, compared to if you're doing the web, you know, see that we talked about books on the web, right? Yeah, you buy a book for the web. You know, like I said, uh, to you guys before uh, in other courses, um, it's good for three months, and then it, the web changes so fast. You know, there's so many new technologies, and trying to put to get to be a good web developer, I, I believe, is harder than being any other kind of developer. Right, because there's so many piece parts to the web. Right, you need to know CSS, HTML5, you know JavaScript. Um, you need to know some kind of object-oriented design and development. You need to test driven development. You need to know some kind of package management. It's all taken care of on the web, right? And it's hard. I think it's harder than this. C Sharp is straightforward. C Sharp is a programming language. It's a compiled language that you know we talked about before, and you guys should know all about it already. Who did Comp 100 last semester? Anybody? How about two semesters ago? Right? Some people have. How about you never did Comp 100? You never did Comp 100. That's a good idea, right? You never did Comp 100. Some people might be parachuting into the course because they had previous C Sharp experience, or because they're you know they're coming in from another program. And if you did that, that's fine too. You don't have to have done. It's not required for you to do Comp 100, which is like you know programming 101 in C Sharp here at Centennial. But um, you should know about variables. <laughs> You should know about arrays, you know, those kind of things. Um, you should have learned about arrays in Comp 100, right? Um, I'll tell you that most people who, who say, quote, unquote, they know arrays, don't know anything about arrays. Yeah, I'll tell you right now. doesn't matter what programming language I, I give it to you. If I give you Java with arrays, C Sharp with arrays, JavaScript with arrays, Python with arrays, whatever. People don't know how to do, but they don't understand arrays very much. So we might have a problem with that when it comes to an, there might be an assignment that comes up about arrays, right? Um, so this this says like I got three tests here and a, a bunch of assignments and quizzes. I'm what the way I do things like I talked about yesterday in another class is um, I do lab and then quiz, lab and then quiz, lab and then quiz. Every other day you're gonna get something. So today you're gonna go lab. It's gonna be due Wednesday. In fact, it's already up on Easton Ten. If you want to take a look, right? It's worth two percent of your final mark. Right, so if you do your lab, and you do your tests, then you're gonna be fine, right? Um, let's take a look at the schedule for a second, then I'll talk about some resources. So again, 
today and next day, we're really doing an intro, a review of, of C Sharp, if you haven't done C Sharp in a while. Visual Studio, I'm going to be using 2015. The machine in front of you uses 2015. That's okay. It's almost identical. There's going to be some changes in terms of GitHub and the way it, you know uh, GitHub is handled. That's okay. But more or less, you can do everything that I'm doing with Visual Studio 2015. Um, so that's in a nutshell. I'm also going to be talking about something new this year compared to other years. We're going to be using a little bit of something called test-driven development, right? Because it's kind of a new hot topic out there. Um, well, not new. Actually, it's not new, but it's still hot. Um, and the reason for that is because it helps us develop better code, it helps you become better coders, right? And not just for C Sharp or Java, but also in JavaScript and other languages as well. So we're going to be talking about that today for the first day, right? What test-driven development is and all that kind of stuff. That's really week one in a nutshell, today and the next day. We, in this class, we have uh, you know, two, uh, two parts, right, two days. Uh, part one, or day one, if you will, is during this time frame, which is 12.30 to 2.30 on Tuesdays. And then part two is on, on Fridays between 10.30 and 12.30, right? So that's, I believe, and that's, I don't think it's in this class. I think it's in A311, if I'm not wrong, right? So um, that's really the schedule for classes, right? So you're going to say, well, if you're recording the videos, and I kind of said it yesterday, do I have to come to class? Well, it's really optional for you if you want to come at all, right? I mean, you paid for the course, right? So if you don't want to come to class at all, it's up to you. But every class, I'm going to do something. There's going to be something we're talking about. And, you know, I mean, yes, you might, you might get it on the video, and that's why I do the videos. I do the videos as extra material, so that way, if you miss something I said, you can always go back and rewind and not listen to my chatter. And if you want to go right to the thing that I've talked about, go right to that thing. Don't listen to me, right? And then go to that section that you missed, because I'm, I'm going to go fast sometimes, right? And sometimes, like I said yesterday, the professor goes so fast, right? You don't know, you know wait, I missed that. Can you go back? Well, I can't go back, because i gotta, I got to move forward so I can show you all the material, right? Not that I don't want to help you guys. I want to help, right? But the thing is, sometimes there's so much material to kind of deliver uh, over the span of time that, you know, I want to make sure that you guys get everything, and that's why I do the videos. It's not for you to skip class and not be around or anything like that. Um, now, what they will do is help you, you know, kind of go back and then if, that, if there's something course specific for this particular course, summer, summer 2016, this video will help you, right? But it's not to say, like I said before, you couldn't look at past videos because the detail of things with, with uh, Visual Studio 2015 and they had other things I talked about in that video because people asked me for those things because I kind of try and respond to what you guys want as students. It's your course, right? I'm putting this on for you. I work for you guys, right, at the end of the day. And like I said uh, yesterday, I'm the kind of professor that I give you 100% first, and then I work backwards, right? So if you don't hand something in, then you lose some marks. And if you don't do a piece of requirement that I've asked you for, you lose some marks there. And I keep doing that until you get whatever mark you're going to get, okay? So that's really the way I do things. So if you look at this st stuff here, we talked about methods um, in part one of this course, right? Part one would be comp 100 which you would have done last semester or semester before, or if you have prior learning experiences, you should have known things like variables, uh, looping, and conditional statements, like if statements and that kind of stuff. You should know all those things if you're creating programs, right, um, coming into this course. If you don't know those things, if you don't know about variables and looping and conditional statements, I really highly recommend you go stop this course and go do another course about looping and command structures and all that stuff, because you need those things. I can't go back and reteach that. Right, but I will be using that stuff, so you'll see it. Now, if you're if you're strong enough as a developer to kind of pick off, pick up from this course on, then I'm going to be talking about stuff as if you know about if statements and variables and all those kind of things, and even arrays. Right, I'm going to talk about that stuff as if you know. You should know that coming into this course. This is not an intro course. Comp 100 is an intro course. This is you know the next course, uh, part two. Um, I would say it's between beginner and intermediate level. I would say still it's easier in a lot of ways than any web course you're going to do if it's a real web course. I have to kind of put a disclaimer on it because some courses, I don't want to go into it. So if it's a real web course, it'll be challenging. If it's not a real cor web course, then you know it's not real. Anyway, so we'll go on from that perspective. But if you if you look at stuff like this, this is a very straightforward course, but it spans up, okay? It spins up in terms of its challenge. Right now it's going to be nice and easy at the beginning. And then later on, this course gets really hard. Right? And why? Because if you look at what we're covering here, so weeks, 
one and two, you know, we talked about advanced method concepts and so on. Weeks three, we get into stuff, stuff like using classes and objects. This is kind of the core of object-oriented uh, development right here, right? So if you've ever done object-oriented development, this is it. You need to, this is like kind of the most important piece of the entire course right here, right? So please do not miss anything to do with weeks one, uh, three to five. This will be bad. We we'll talk more about object-oriented uh, programming as we move into week six and week seven. And again, these are classic examples of how to do object-oriented programming uh, with very simple, straightforward examples and assignments, okay? Then we get into exception handling and file I.O. up here in week eight. This is where it gets a little bit more complex, see? Start off with object-oriented programming, and then by the time we get into weeks nine through 12, we get into things like with uh, uh, Windows Forms, uh, UI, all that kind of stuff happens in, in the later part of the course. It's almost like we do console applications in the first the first part of our course, right, with classes. And then we do UI applications in the second part of our course for Windows, uh, you know, you know, using classes, right? So that's what we do in the second half, right? There is a data component to the course, but it's really, really uh, light in terms of, you know, knowing about uh, databases and all that kind of stuff. I'm probably going to be using the entity framework Right? And I didn't do that last year when we did this course because it wasn't required. But now it's become such an important piece of, of .NET application development that we need to really understand you know, the, the um, entity framework, right? which is what I'm going to be talking about as we get you know, towards the end of the course. Also, it's nice to have, nice to have is an Azure account when we do that. Right? Now we don't need it because we're not doing Azure. We're just doing console applications still. Right? But next half of the course, and I think what I'll probably do is around week eight, I'll do another little lab, sign up for Azure. People who have Azure already, you get bonus marks, right? Because you've already got that uh, for my other course. Um, but, you know, sign up for Azure for the second half, and I'll be using, you know, uh, Microsoft Azure online with an online database to kind of swing data back and forth with your application, right? So something like that towards the end of the course. Some kind of database, anyway. You need something, some kind of data store to play with data. Otherwise, it's not as exciting, right? Okay, so that's what I'm saying, it ramps up. Now, nice and easy, later, really hard, right? So please don't miss your stuff that we're doing today and what we start doing, because I build on everything we do. We start off slow, and then things ramp up and it gets more difficult. Okay, um, as we get to the end, uh, I should probably talk about your assignments and so on. Again, some assignments have been postmarked here in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the outline. Just to note that I may or may not follow the exact assignment that uh, the assignment structure that it says here, right? Only because assignments change year over year. I refresh my stuff. Um, I offer sometimes more assignments. I'm also doing this whole lab and quiz thing. So this week, lab. You got a lab already up on on East Centennial. Next week, quiz. And I'm probably going to do it during the Friday Fridays of our course, right? So Wednesday, nice class. People hate Fridays. They want to miss escape Friday. So that's where I'm going to do my, my quiz. I know people are going to say, Dan, I just have to come to class. Yes, it does. Um, you don't have to come to class, but then you just miss the 2% every Friday. And there's a lot of Fridays in this course, so that means that it's going to happen here. What happens on a long weekend, though? Because there's going to be some weekends that we have a long weekend on a Friday. We don't come in. I'll do the quiz on the Wednesday, if, if it happens to be that way. Okay? So just FYI, that's where I'll do things a little differently. Labs and quizzes will be approximately 2 to 3% every time I do a lab or a quiz. Right? So the lab this week is 2%. Next week, the quiz, which is going to happen on Friday, next week, Friday, is going to be 2% of your final mark, right? And it'll be based on all the stuff we talked about this week, right? So it'll keep you sharp. So if you haven't done your stuff, your lab, and if you haven't worked with C Sharp, and if I quiz you next week, you're going to be like, oh, damn, right? So keep on top of stuff. And watch the videos, because a lot of stuff that I talked about in the videos are going to be on your quiz. The quizzes are going to be 5 to 10 questions. They're not going to be that big. It's not going to be like a test every week or right, every other week. It's going to be a little quiz. And five to ten questions talking about the things we talked about before. And then as we, we if, you, if you think about that, if I have five or more quizzes, that's like 10%, right, of your final mark, right? Five labs, let's say, probably something like that. Um, it's going to be around 10%. So it's 20% of your final mark in labs and quizzes, right? Which makes it really important that you show up to class. Right? But that's up to you again. It's your, cl it's your class. You're paying me to put this on. I'm trying to do the best be the best experience I can give you, right? And I work for you, remember that, which means I gotta make sure, if you don't understand something, put your hand up, say I don't get it, right? Or can you explain that again? Because that's what I'm here for. Hours of operation, for me, 
right? If you need me, um, I'm going to be at school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I will not be here Thursday. I will be here on Fridays as well. I have regular office hours on Mondays after 10.30 in the morning uh, until the afternoon, 4 o'clock, something like that. Um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays until from 8.30 in the morning, approximately 9 o'clock, let's say, uh, until about uh, till this class starts. And then on Fridays after, 10, after 12.30, after your class on Fridays, so 12.30 on, right? So book some time, please, if you need me. Um, and you can always reach me via cell, which I'll pass to you. I will put on a video because I don't, people, I don't want people to watch the video and know my cell number. But if you need my cell number, if you want to contact me directly, you can certainly uh, connect with you. I have no problem with that at all. You can also connect with me on, on uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter. You can connect all those things as well. Um, so I'm going to make myself available for you for, for any kind of questions. Please don't wait until the last day that your assignment is due to get together with me. That won't happen. Right? Um, and please don't ask me for extensions. Professor, professor, I really need an extension uh, because my assignment's due tomorrow and I have four other, sorry, seven other classes that I'm doing with some people or whatever it's going to be, six other classes for some, five other classes for others. And I'm really busy and I can't do your assignment because, you know, your assignment's not as important as the other classes. Sorry, guy and, or girl, I can't. You know, i got a schedule to keep too. And so I probably won't give you an extension unless, unless there's some kind of extraneous circumstance. Like, I don't know, if it snows in May or something like that, which is not going to happen, right? Or if you're sick, if you got if you're sick, you can get a legitimate note and you need an extension. Yeah, okay, something that's reasonable. I should also mention some norms about class. I'm going to start exactly on time, right? Um, and that's cool for if you walk in afterwards. But on a test, if you walk after after half an hour of test time, once you walk in, you won't be able to do your test. I won't allow you to, right? So if you're late for your tests, you got to be within the first half an hour. Otherwise, see ya, right? And the reason why is because it's really disruptive for students too, right? If everyone walks in different times. Um, tests are, you know, we only have an hour and a half really when, in, during class to write your test. And um, a lot of times I have a, two components to the test. I might have a, a practical component as well as a, a written component, uh, you know, one of those kind of things. So, I mean, it's a lot of stuff to do in two, you know, in two hours or so. And I really don't like to be disrupted by other students running in late, right? Which is kind of disrespectful to everybody. Also, on a test, a lot of times I'll tell you when it's okay to be open book. Some tests will be open book. Some tests will be closed book. Some tests, you know, you'll be able to work with other people, right? Depending on what test we're doing, right? One thing to note is that in a test, unless I otherwise, unless I say so, there's no talking, there's no cell phone use, there's no texting, there's no, you know, any kind of messaging whatsoever, right? If I see you doing that kind of stuff, um, I'll have to ask you to leave. That's bad. I just have to say at the beginning, this is just norms. I apologize. I'm not trying to be negative, right? But it happens every semester where someone doesn't know that they're not, not allowed to use their cell phone in a test right, or something like that. If your cell phone rings, that's bad. If you answer your cell phone, you're out. <laughs> um, you know, that's just not something we do. I'm also, when it comes to cheating, I have to kind of mention this thing because it comes up every semester and every class that someone thinks it's okay that they use someone else's work that they found on the web. It's not okay, right? Please don't use anybody else's work for any reason unless I specify you can. For example, I might say something like this. It's okay to use my code. If I say that, it's okay, right? Otherwise, it's not okay. So if, you, if you're not sure, in your mind, it's not okay. I'm telling you now. It's not okay to use anybody else's code unless I specifically say so. If you have a question, if you want to add out some kind of feature that you, we haven't covered in class and you want to see if it's okay, ask me and I'll tell you if it's okay. Right? If it's not okay, you'll know, and you won't get in trouble. Please don't share your work with other students. Although, we're going to be talking about GitHub, and it's a shareable place, a place where you can collaborate, right, online. So you can look at someone else's code to get examples. Doesn't mean you can't look. Don't close your eyes. You can't look at someone else's code. I'm not saying that, right? That's unreasonable. In real life, we search the web all the time for solutions, right? I'm not going to stop that from happening. But what I'm saying is make it your own. Right? Try to understand what you're learning because when it comes to a test, right, it's going to be you and probably you alone. So if you always collaborate with other people, it'll be a challenge. Okay, that's it for me. I'm not going to lecture you anymore on that. I, I, by the way, that's the piece I hate. I hate that part of the, you know talking about that stuff. It's ugly and, and I hate it. Right, But it, it's something we have to talk about because every semester, someone makes a mistake and then, you know, it's bad things that happen. And it's a waste of my time, waste of your time. Okay, so um, so the positive stuff is I want you to um, to study every week, 
if you look at the book, the book we're using is the exact same book we're using Comp 100, right? So um, I'm going to be putting up my, my, my PowerPoints. Right now, you have a little PowerPoint that's on there. Um, it's all around test-driven development, right? I guarantee you, if I'm talking about something and I'm showing a PowerPoint in class, hint, hint, it's going to be on a test somewhere, right? Just saying, right? That means I prepared work. I'm showing you what to do. You need to know how to do it, right? Which means somewhere, at some point, I'm going to put it up on a test or ask you to do it. Okay, any questions before we begin? That's just your intro on what's the outline. Say that again. It is available, yeah. yeah. So on a test? Online? Yeah, it's on there. If you look at eCentennial, all my PowerPoints are in PDF format uh, under week one for this week. And every week, I'll have another week container. And then you'll see my PowerPoints in that week, right? As well as any other things I give you. Um, your assignments will be in their own. They'll be everything I do, by the way. That's a good thank you for that. That kind of prompted me to think what else. I don't do any paper tests. So there's no paper in this course, period. I don't do any. You won't get a paper test. I won't want you to give me a paper assignment. I don't do that paper stuff. Paper stuff doesn't work for me. Everything is going to be online that I do. Right? So um, when we talk about something uh, here in the course, it's going to be online. Right? If you do a test, it's going to be online. When you submit an assignment, online. There's no paper assignments. I don't want to give you, don't give me a paper lab. And please, whatever you do, never, ever send me your assignment through email. I will not accept it. All right? Ever. If it's closed, an example of this would be, let's say, for example, I open up an assignment, but it closes on a Friday. So you can't submit after a Friday. But then you send me an email. It's not going to be, I won't accept it. I'll just bounce it. Right? So please don't do that. Um, assignments have to be delivered to me via eCentennial. All right, that's how it, you know how it happens. There's no other way you can you can submit an assignment. Okay, please don't do that. If you need space, if you if you're running late or um, really late, for me to close an assignment means that it's already late. Right, because I don't close I don't do the close the assignment off on Dropbox for a couple of days, which means you're already a couple of days late when I closed it. Right, so I don't close it like the day of. That's crazy. Right, so if it's due, let's say Friday at midnight, I might close it on Monday. Right. And if I close it on Monday, it's closed. Like it's not, it's not going to open up again. Okay. Um, so yeah. So this, so this is kind of an overview of what we're doing in class um, and all that kind of stuff. But really, we're talking about a very interesting subject because of C sharp. If you're doing, who's in a game development program? Anyone in a game development program here? That's okay, I got a couple of people, maybe one or two. Um, if you're a game developer, you two guys, C sharp is like the lifeblood of Unity, right? Which we use in Unity all the time. So if you're a Unity developer. You need to know C-sharp. Um, this course is like the most important course for you when it comes to understanding Unity. Um, if you want to be a real game developer, you should know C++ too, putting it out there, right? But C-sharp is a great beginning. It's a great intro to programming um, and all that kind of stuff as well. So uh, it'll be really important for you. If you're another developer, if you're not in, in a game programming person, that's OK, right? Um, because if you're doing something like health informatics, um, or if you're doing something else, another kind of program whatsoever, C Sharp is you know Microsoft's language of choice, right, for developing programs right now. So it's awesome and it's a great base. Everything you learn here in C Sharp, you can do almost the exact same thing in Java or another language that's object oriented. Okay, that's really good stuff, right? So that's why C Sharp is really really important. Microsoft has some great tools. I'm gonna switch over here to uh, Windows right now. Switch to Windows. Um, Notice I'm using a Mac and I'm virtualizing Windows with VMware. Okay, so look at Windows. Um, you've got you know you've got your Visual Studio. I'm using Visual Studio 2015 today, right? Um, last semester when I did this, last time I did this a year ago, I used Visual Studio 2015. There's been some changes, some really cool advancements in Visual Studio 2015. Really cool things you can do in Visual Studio 2015 you can't do in 2015, like. Um, some Windows presentation stuff that you couldn't do. So there's a new framework that's come out, almost like a standard Windows library that we can do. We'll talk about that a little bit. So some new stuff that you can do in, in, uh, in, in Visual Studio 2015. But otherwise, it's identical. Uh, I mean, it's still around, I think it's like, I think 80 million lines of code now, right? Something crazy, right? It's the mother of all IDEs. Like it's a crazy big um, integrated development environment. Um, you can do everything with it, C++ if you wanted to, C Sharp, Java if you really want to. 
although I don't recommend. I think you're better off using something like an Eclipse or an IntelliJ for Java, right? But you could. You could even do PHP, although I don't recommend. I, I rather do, I, in fact, for, for web development, I don't recommend. Not because I don't think Visual Studio is awesome. I think it's great. If you're doing ASP.NET web applications, Visual Studio is for you, right? If you're doing any other kind of web applications, then Visual Studio is too fat to me, right? I think you should probably use something else. But that's just my opinion. Um, Anyways, but I think it's great. If you, I mean, it's good for a lot of things. F Sharp, um, it's a great little environment. So please kick off your Visual Studio 2013 in front of you. Or if you have Visual Studio 2015 that you've got on a laptop, which I highly recommend, laptop to have more control, that's great. So when I say in front of you, I mean on the computer that the, the school has applied. There should be Visual Studio 2013. Please kick it off right now. Because the way I do my lectures, I do lecture, lab, all at the same time. I don't do like a lecture, one class, lab, and next doesn't make sense to me. So I kind of do everything together mixed. And that way you guys keep, you know, from being bored out of your skulls, right? So you're going to be talking and you're going to go, oh my God, I'm going to die, right? So I don't want that because some of this can be a little dry for some people if you're not, if you don't love programming, right? Even if you're a developer, you may not love programming. Okay, so Visual Studio 2015. What we're going to do is we're going to launch a new application. And I want to kind of launch a couple of things in a second. Um, but something to note is when I go file new, I'm starting off project, in this class, we'll be doing, in the beginning, I'll be going to Visual C Sharp. And again, you can key your Visual Studio to start off Visual C Sharp or Visual Basic or some other language first. Mine has kind of been configured for Visual C Sharp first. I'm not going to make a blank app. That's in 2015, I'm able to make something called a universal Windows application. Um, and there's been a lot of criticism, by the way, from, from people about universal Windows apps. People hate them, right? Especially uh, game developers on Steam. They're like, oh my god, Windows, universal Windows apps suck. But don't say, actually, it's a really good platform because the, the idea that if for them is it's supposed to work on all platforms, cross-platform across all uh, Microsoft products. Uh, eventually, their Microsoft phone, their tablets, um, their computers, PCs. Um, it's a universal platform, even the web. Right? That's the idea for that, right? Nice idea, Microsoft, but it's, it's always hard to execute that kind of stuff. And there's going to always be criticism on that. Um, I still think it's a great platform, but we're not going to be covering it this semester, right? Windows Forms application. We will cover Windows Forms application. This is the older framework. Windows Forms applications that to make Windows Forms, Windows applications that are compatible with Windows uh, XP up, actually, I would say, right? So um, we will be using those, not today. The WPF application framework is a newer way of doing Windows applications, uh, making Windows. We might be covering some of this, but I'll be honest with you, still the, the most common ones are Windows form applications, believe it or not. Just like on the web, if you're using the .NET framework, .NET web forms are the most common .NET applications you'll see out there, as opposed to .NET MVC if you're an MVC person, right? What we will be doing today is starting off the console application, just like we did last time. So this is kind of a review of stuff that we've done before, right? So you should have know how to create console applications. So this is what we're going to be doing, a console application. But before we begin, I want to talk about a couple of technologies that we're going to use this semester. Um, I'm going to keep this kind of dialog box open here for a second while I go over to what I'm going to be using. One of the things I, want, I will ask you to use, and I put it up there as a requirement on um, on eCentennial is for your lab one is to create a GitHub account. So what is GitHub? Here's GitHub account. And on GitHub, it won't look like this for you. If you're new to GitHub, it'll look like this, right? You sign up for free. And what it is is it gives you a cloud container for you for where you can put up your applications, right? Now, some people might use it as a backup. But there's really three really good reasons to use GitHub, like I've talked about in other classes. One is a backup. The second one, which is most popular, for version control. If you want to version your, your, your code, version one, version two, version three, keep track of your versions. And the third one is for collaboration. If I want to share it with somebody else, I want to share my code with somebody else or work in a group, a team, GitHub is for you. So by the way, when we learn things with uh, Unity, if you're a Unity developer, we also use GitHub, right? Um, because what we want to do is share our code on GitHub, with another team member, um, and, and so on. There's two kinds of GitHub repositories you can create. One of them is 
a public repository, which is the most common, right? And there's also private repositories that you have to pay for, except your students, and you don't have to pay for anything. So if you go to DreamSpark, Microsoft DreamSpark, or go to dreamspark.com, uh, and you say, if you go to the student, I'm just going to, you know, kind of to the beginning of this. If I go to dreamspark.com, and if I go to students, and if I go to software catalog, right, you're going to see that there's a couple of pieces of software here that are open for you. One of them is um, Microsoft Azure, which is if you're, if you're doing later on in the course of using this piece. Signing up for it now doesn't hurt. Um, and this pack, which is really cool, which is GitHub for education. Right? So if I click on GitHub education pack, and if I click on get your pack, by the way, it takes a day or so sometimes. Right? What you get is some excellent software uh, deals that, for free. Um, example, $50 platform credit for uh, DigitalOcean. Um, five private repos with GitHub, which is awesome. So you can keep your stuff private if you want. Right, and I recommend, um, and other things as well inside your um, your package that may or may not make any sense for you. Unreal for those people who are gamers is really cool. You can get an Unreal free anyway. You can download Unreal as a student, and it's about I'll be honest, it's about ten gigs, right? Ten to twenty gigs of stuff. Same thing with your Unity, pretty damn big, right? So uh, um, it's pretty large. But this one gives you a bunch of stuff for free. And it's free for students, right? So sign up for it now. Um, we'll be using GitHub. And if you want to use private repos that you want to have me as a collaborator on, uh, we can certainly do that. OK. Or if you want to do it for yourself as a student, it's really cool to do that too. OK, so that's that's one thing we get from our um, from DreamSpark. There's others. The other one that's really, uh, there's this, this is one uh, website for DreamSpark. But there are other websites that are really cool here as well. Check something here. Yeah. Um, so if I go to the other one that you might see as well is the, the Centennial uh, Academic si Software Discounts site, which is this one. For those people who are doing things with VMware, if you're virtualizing Windows like I am, you can get the latest version of VM VMware Fusion from Mac free, right? You don't have to pay for it. Uh, normally, it's like uh, fifty-five dollars for the for the uh, regular version. Uh, Totally worth it. I recommend anyway. Um, if you're going to buy anything from VMware, the VMware Fusion or VMware Workstation, awesome. I don't work for VMware, I swear. And um, the other one is um, the other site that you'll see a lot in your Centennial College is this other one, which is Centennial's DreamSpark, which is uh, e5 on the hub.com and so on. Um, you can look at the video to get the exact address. Once you um, once you get here, you notice that there is, you can always download Visual Studio 2015, right? Uh, Community Edition normally, or Visual Studio 2015, like the full version from this one. Here's, here it is right here. Right? So if you're going to download this and install it on your machine, because we're largely going to be doing Visual Studio, um, I recommend the Enterprise Edition with Update 2. Okay, if you're downloading Visual Studio, um, you might as well get the latest version. This is the one. You can always go with Visual Studio with Update 2 by itself. That'll work fine, too. Community Edition is also very good. All of them work with what we're doing today. Okay, It's nothing that's going to hurt you. There's other stuff here you can look at as well, but I don't recommend you touch any of it. Just those things. Right? Um, if you do, I mean, you see there's also Update 1. I don't recommend that. Why would you get Update 1? Then you have to download and install it and you know, update your Visual Studio again. If you're on the web program with me, again, if you're downloading Visual Studio 2015, I do recommend Update 2. Don't download Update one. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so if I downloaded the Enterprise Edition of Visual Studio 2015, I go in here, I download, add to cart, and if you follow, if you're if you're a subscriber to DreamSpark, and you all should be, because who, who by the way, who's never gone on DreamSpark? Here at Centennial, you should have all gone by now, right? Yay! <laughs> so, by the way, there's been classes that I put my hand up. Who's gone? No one's gone on DreamSpark, right? That's crazy. Um, so download your version of Visual Studio 2015 on your laptop if you have one, and I do recommend you bring your laptop in as opposed to the machine in front of you because it's more control, not because the machine doesn't work. The machine works. More control on your laptop. Okay, so this is where I'm going to get my software. So again, one step one for the lab is sign up for GitHub, right? This is cool. And again, there's, you can also get the GitHub a student pack like I talked about from DreamSpark. When you sign up, you're going to create a repository. But what is a repository anyway? What are we talking about? Well, I did this little drawing yesterday. Imagine you've got your local machine, right? In your local machine, you've got your 
your, 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 your work folder, wherever you're working is, your working folder. When you create a GitHub repo, what you're actually doing is creating an invisible .git folder that's inside on your machine. That's what you're doing. And this is where, you know, where all your um, versions are saved locally on your machine. So you have something called a local repo, right, on your local machine. And you, work, you can work like this a lot. But what happens, like I said, if somehow you know, your dog eats your machine, right, and now there's no more machine. It's gone, right? No more machine, you're going to say, Professor, <laughs> my dog ate my machine, or my dog peed on my machine, or whatever, or my machine fell out my window you know, when I was trying to you know, do an Instagram image or whatever. And uh, you know what? Now it's gone. And I don't have my machine anymore. It doesn't work. And I can't. I need an extension because I can't you know, give you my assignment number. X, you know, that's due on Friday. I know I'm telling you on Friday that it's due today, and I can't do my assignment, but I, I need an extension. My answer is going to be no, <laughs> right? You have GitHub, right? And um, GitHub, what it does is, you know, you push your uh, your local work, you push your work up the line as it goes to GitHub, and it duplicates it up on GitHub as another repo. That's what happens. So you take your local work here, and you push it to GitHub. That's what happens, right? And you have a copy online. So you have something called a local repo, which is on your machine, and a remote repo, which is on GitHub. This platform as a service that gives you, you know, this uh, um, a platform we can work on and do our work. So GitHub. Okay, very cool. So that's what we're going to be doing. You sign up for GitHub, and you create a local repo, and then a remote repo. We're going to do that today, and I'm going to hopefully I'll get all that done for you, so you can submit your assignment, your lab one which is due Friday at midnight. Right? That's your first lab, OK? So there are a couple ways to do this. Um, there's two approaches. And one of them is, by the way, if, you're, if you don't have GitHub available to you for this course, you can always download the desktop version of GitHub if you don't like command line. So you can always go to desktop.github.com, download and install GitHub. But the great thing is that Visual Studio has a lot of Git tools kind of included inside of it. Um, when you first create a project in Visual Studio, down here, if you've never done anything with GitHub, it'll say, add to source control. It won't say GitHub, right? Add to source control. Click on that button when we create our new, a new uh, assignment, right? Our new project. Add to source control. So that's right down on the bottom, this little checkbox. Mine says create new Git repository because I've specified that Git is my default provider, right? You can do that as well. When you click add to source control, you can choose which one and if you want to make it your permanent um, you know, provider for, for version control. All right? So let's do this together. So I'm going to make this new project, and I'm going to call this thing comp123. Now, remember, we're in the winter, sem so, sorry, the summer 2016 semester. So it's going to be S2016. That's going to be what it's going to look like on, on GitHub for me. Uh, and it's going to be lesson one. OK? So that's one way application or my project is going to be called. I'm going to choose a console application. Here's my console app, right? And I'm going to click on add to, to source control down here or add, create a new Git repository. Now notice, it's going to go into my version. My location is users, tom, documents, comp123. It might be different for you. That's totally cool. I'm going to click OK. Now, this is a review. It's a refresher of what happened before. So if you've seen this stuff, hey, don't get mad. You're reviewing, refreshing for people who've never seen it or haven't seen it for a long time, right? Now, if you notice that when I click on, I'm just going to pin this thing, uh, pin the tail of the donkey over here, and get my solution explorer up and working. If you notice here, I've got my solution. Here's my solution, and here's my project. In my project, I have a, a simple class, static class right now. Hey, question for you guys. Is this class private or public by default? Wrong. Private by default, right? So if if I don't have anything here, if it's if it's not nothing in front of the class, default is private. This public in a second, yes. GitHub, Git. Thank you for. So the question is, if you choose source control, do you choose team? Team Foundation or Git, you choose Git. And there's also a little checkbox that says, please use this as the default. You see that? 
use the select system while creating new products. Click on that little checkbox down there so it always comes up as good, all right? You don't want it to change on you all the time. All right, cool. So now that I've got this uh, as Git, right, There's this is my solution explorer tab. I also have down here on the bottom, and you should have it, my team explorer tab. There it is, my team explorer tab. All right, cool. Notice um, for me, because I'm using 2015, I have on the top right my repository name, right? On the top right in 2015, it says changes to comp123 summer 2016 lesson one. You may or may not have that if you're using 2013. Right, but you'll see that I have that up there. So there's two tabs. If you don't have the Team Explorer tab, you can always pull it up by going to Window, or sorry, um, if you're going to uh, View, and you go to uh, Team Explorer, you can bring up your Team Explorer tab, which is right here. If you don't have it somehow on, on, on your sidebar, okay? So that's really, it. that's how we, we set up. GitHub is basically running already, if you've done everything that I've done. I'm going to make some changes to my application, right, in a second. But we're going to be talking about test-driven development first. So don't do anything right now to your application. Leave it as is, right? There's my app. Um, but what I want to do is I want to put this up on GitHub, right? My first iteration of my application. This is my first version, right? So how do I do that? Well, first, I need a space for GitHub for me to put it, right? And if you have, um, if you have Visual Studio 2015, you can actually do it within Visual Studio 2015, like everything, create the, create the repository, the whole thing. But I'm going to assume you don't have 2015. You only have 2013. So the do way to do it is do it manually like me. So go up on GitHub. I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to just close all this stuff down for a second. And go up on GitHub. Here's, your, here's my GitHub. There's a little plus sign over here, right? And if I click on the plus sign, after you've created your GitHub account, click on the plus sign, and you go new repository, right? Under new repository, you pick your your account. Now I have multiple accounts. One of them that I'm going to share with you is Centennial College, right? Like where I have all my stuff for you, right? And I'm going to name my my uh, a repository the same as what I've called my project, which is Comp One Two Three Summer Twenty Sixteen Lesson One, right? I think I called it that, right? Yes, I did. Thank God. Okay. Um, there we go. So there it is. Now notice I have a choice to make it public or private. If I make it private, I gotta pay, so I don't want to do that. I'll make it public for you guys. You don't have to log in to get my stuff. I'm not gonna initialize my repo with a readme file. I could, I'm not gonna do that right now. I'm not gonna add anything, any git ignore file. Uh, by the way, Microsoft adds it all automatically for you. With me when I see you guys tomorrow, I'll talk more about this again. Okay, create repository. When I create my repository, boom -a boom I have a container. I have a container for my, my repository that's online. Okay, let's pause here for a second. So what are the steps? I've, I go to the plus sign, click the plus button, create a unique name. So if I go plus new repository, and do this again, right? Notice that the name has to be unique. It's unique for your, re for your repo, for your name. Right? Your name and your account, every repository you, you, you connect, you create, has to be unique. It can't be the same name, All right? Hey, how about if I want to find my repository? Oh man, I, I lost my repository now. What do I do? Well, I can go to my name, and if I if I look at my, my profile, well, you see all my repositories. This is all my activity over the last 708 days or whatever the hell it is, right? Um, you know, and then you can see that here are all my repositories, and one of the ones I kind of put up under me. This is me. This is not on uh, on Centennial College. Was my cloud build demo that I did for Unity, where I did cloud build. Uh, but I have this other one. If you notice, you want to find what we're doing here today, you look at Centennial College. Centennial College, you look there and see, look, here, here's Comp 1, 2, 3, session, you know, season, you know, or uh, summer 2016, lesson one. I was going to say season six, or, you know, like you download stuff for, for, for TV, right? Season six of The Walking Dead. Okay, let's, uh, let's go through here. So you see that this is my lesson. And the, the important part about this one is that you have this little URI right here. See this URI, this .git URI? You need that to connect to your Visual Studio. Don't have this can't connect to Visual Studio, right? Let's do that with Visual Studio now. I'm just gonna pull up Visual Studio, here we are. Yep. Uh, SSH would be through command line. HTTPS would be a secure socket that you'd be using um, through your web browser, right? 
secure socket connection is what you're using down here with SSH, and you'll be doing that for your command line. So if you actually command line it, click on SSH, it'll give you a different um, option here, and and some different uh, you know commands here on your uh, inside your uh, your page here. But we want HTTPS, which is cool, so I'm leaving it as that. Okay, so and notice there's also a little button that says set up in desktop. If you have your desktop app that you can download, by the way, free for GitHub, if you are not a person who likes to type stuff in and you don't want to use Visual Studio, for whatever reason you can't connect with Visual Studio, you can always use the desktop app to connect to your GitHub repo uh, through your operating system. Right? So you can do it separately as well. There's a standalone desktop app you can download. It's not required for this course. All right, so let's go back to, sorry, so let's see this. Uh, wanted to do one of these and put these desktops in. Okay, so what I meant to do is here, I want to connect me myself with Team Explorer now, right? And notice that if I go home, I want to sync my changes, right? Sync my changes with Team, with team Explorer. By the way, this works with Visual Studio 2013 as well, so please do this with me if you've already created your GitHub app. So it works, right? So if you click sync, now, there's, these are the new options in Visual Studio 2015. Take a look how beautiful this is. I have published to Visual Studio team services. No, I don't, right? I also have published to GitHub. If I click on publish to GitHub, I can actually create my GitHub account, my GitHub, my GitHub repo, and everything else right here for Visual Studio 2015. It's wonderful. It's a great addition to, to, uh, to Visual Studio. I'm not going to use this one, though, because some people don't have 2015. They might have something like publish to remote repository or something else in here. And this is what I'm going to be using. And all I need to do is in here, I have to put in the URL of my GitHub repo right here. So let's do that. So kind of take it from here. It's got to be in this form, by the way. Right? So I'm going to copy it, go over here, and then I'm going to paste it. And there's my GitHub link, my link to GitHub right here. And then I click Publish. Now, if you haven't done this before, it's going to ask you to log in. It's going to ask you for your credentials, in fact. What are your credentials? Can you log in? What is your GitHub account? and your password and all that stuff for the first time. It may ask also, under settings, so if I go home, right, under settings, you may not see all this stuff, by the way, because this is Visual Studio 2015 stuff. You may only see changes, you may see sync, you may see some of the other stuff, but none of, the other, none, none of these pull requests and everything else. This is all new for 2015, which is awesome, right? But if you take a look at settings, that's going to be there. And under settings, if I look at global settings, It'll be the name, like your username, your email address. That I'm using, I'm using my my uh, uh, at hotmail.com. By the way, this is a great email address to use as a backup for me. If you can't reach me for whatever reason, I'm Centennial. My uh, up at uh, my.centennialcollege.ca. You always use this one. I'm okay with that. All right? And here's my uh, my default repository location, which is GitHub, and enable download of author images. I'm enabling that for sure, and I'm committing changes after my merge by default. And so on. All these things are in my global settings. You have to put this stuff in for yourself, or else you won't know. Visual Studio won't know how to connect and who you are, right? So you had to configure Visual Studio for this in the beginning. All right, cool. But once you've done that, if I click Home, like I said, and if I click Sync, as long as I have uh, I've, I've set up my repository now, I can always do a pull or a push to GitHub. So what is a pull or a push? Let's go back to this again. So if I've got my little diagram here, whenever I do a push, I push my work. I take my local folder and I push it up to my remote. That's what I'm doing. I can also do a pull, which means I take my remote and I pull it back down to my, my local repo. Why would I do that? What if you've, you know, dogs eating your homework kind of stuff, right? And there's no more local repo and you get a new machine from Costco, right? Well, you may want to pull down your work, right? Or the other reason why is maybe you're um, – you know, you're working with a partner in a real life situation, and you're working on one part of the application, and your partner's working on something else, right? Then you push up to GitHub. This is one way to do things, right? And then your partner pulls your changes down to his machine. He works on his stuff. This works well with Unity, by the way. Works nicely on his stuff, right? And then when he's done, he pushes everything up to GitHub, and then your partner pulls everything back down again. And then you have this check in, check out system. By the way, there's way better ways to do it. That way, that's very simple kind of passing the baton method to work with somebody else. All right, so GitHub is the way we keep a backup. And by the way, why am I talking about GitHub anyway? Why am I sharing this stuff with you? Why am I forcing you to use GitHub? Because every assignment is going to require GitHub, every single one. 
there's always going to be a GitHub component in every assignment it's worth four marks of your final of your assignment, which is usually around 10%, right? So if you don't put things up on GitHub, then you're losing marks every time. So please sign up for GitHub now. I'm, I'm kind of paying you to sign up, right? I'm giving you 2% to sign up for GitHub and, and put up your, uh, your project, right? So please do it now, with me at least. OK, cool. So I've got this thing. I've got my stuff up on GitHub. Let's take a look and see what it looks like on GitHub now that I've put it up there. So here's what it looked like before. If I refresh, you should see, if you put it up here, something that looks like this. OK, this is good for what we're doing. But if you're a web student, this will not work for you if you're going to kind of put this up in Microsoft. Because the problem with Microsoft Azure, it needs to see this folder, not this folder. But for us, what we're doing, this is perfectly fine. So please use this. When you put up your projects, I want to see it like this. This is where it's going to be up on GitHub, like this. All right, I don't want to see it like buried. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this download zip button, and I'm going to download your project right, right onto my hard drive. By the way, you can always download my project. If somehow I went too fast, download it now, right? Check it out. It's up on GitHub, Centennial College forward slash comp123, summer 2016 lesson one, and you can launch it in your application on your, uh, um, in your code. OK, so this is the first change we made. We kind of put together this little simple app that does nothing. All right, that's all it does. It's kind of our initial commit. And by default, the first commit, when I talk about commits on GitHub, what I really mean is, snapshot. I take a snapshot of my code and I, I create a name for it. The name is whatever you want to make it, but the first name should always be something like initial commit or first commit. That is the convention we use for the name that we, make, we name our snapshot, our first snapshot. Every time we make a code change, I add a feature, I fix a bug, I do a commit. Okay? I want to do a commit often. And the reason for that is I can always step back. Right? Let's take a look on GitHub right now what I got. If I look at GitHub, I have two commits. Let's take a look. I've got something called, you know, add project files. And I also have something else called add git ignore and git, uh, git attributes file, right? Both of these two commits were created by Microsoft to Visual Studio. I didn't do these. This is automatically made inside my Visual Studio 2015. And for you, it'll be the same if you're using 2015. Who's got problems doing this right now? What is your problem? Yes. So what that means is if you go to home, right, and then you go to changes, right, you'll see this little thing that says add, to add and it won't look like this, but it'll say add everything, to add the changes, because you'll see a bunch of changes listed here, a bunch of files on the right, right? And you want to add all those files and make a commit message, like initial commit. You want to put the commit message up here, and then all the files you click on that you want to add those into the changes. Once you make your commit message and you say commit, commit all or commit, it'll add all those things to the, to the staging area. See, Git is a funny thing, right? Git is kind of like a triple, I don't know, a three-tier system, if you will. So the diagram I showed you earlier, this diagram is actually wrong, right? This is a very simple diagram. What's really happening is, see this little git, dot git folder? It's actually something called a staging area. And it actually deserves its own little box. So let me put it over here like this. Black, come on, I'm not a black guy. Like that, I want to be a white over here. I'm talking about white as in a white box, not a white guy, sorry. For those people who may, who may have misinterpreted me, no, I don't mean that at all. I love all colors, right? I'm talking about this here, the box I'm making up here. Wow, I got myself in trouble there. All right, so let's talk, talk about this. So here's my black border with my white box. That's what I meant. And I want to put this right here, um, way over here on the side here. Wow, I don't know how that happened. Um, anyways, so here's my, uh, I'm going to put my border up here. So see, I'm, just using, I'm using this little thing here uh, so you can see it. And what I mean by that is it's just, let's put it up the chain here. Let's put it up over the top. OK, let's put it the other way. Oh. <clears throat> These are just layers in, um, in fireworks. And all I want to try and do is I want to make this move so that way this is on top of the other one. Because right? right now, here's my box, and it's way over here. It's my latest one. And what I want to do is I want to move this one way over on top of that one. So I'll put this in here, and then it shows. And I'm using this as almost like a whiteboard, a virtual whiteboard that I'm, I'm uh, kind of putting up there. There you go. 
So here's the dot git, but dot git is actually what this is, just to, to go back to reality, what we were talking about here. Um, you know, and forgive me for, for saying anything wrong, guys. Please I apologize in advance if I said it the wrong way. I didn't mean it that way. Right. Hey, man, the guy who walked in now, can you go and fix that? Because you just knocked the door off. Sorry, buddy. Thanks. Um, yeah, so if you notice this, you have this other, um, this other place here, this other place that's called the staging area, right? So if I click on this thing, this is actually called the staging area. So actually what we really do with Git is do this, right? Thank you. Uh, what we're doing is, before it goes to my, re my remote repository, right, there's actually this other area, this other folder. So here's my local repository and my local work. Thank you. This way over here. Here's my local work here. What I want to do is before it goes into my local repo, right? Before I go into my local repo, it actually looks like this. Give me a second. So I'm going to do this three this three tier stuff so you understand a little bit better. Yes, it's always black. Lovely. <clears throat> it's my fault. Okay, and here's my work. And bear with me while I put this on here. It's going to be way at the bottom. We're going to put this so it's at the top. There we go. All right, so really what's happening is this. You have this folder where all your work is, is stored, right? And before it goes to your, um, I'll take the local machine away. Before it goes to your local repo, this is local, by the way, all local stuff. It's actually broken into these other containers. And I wanted to show you this to you so you're, so you're not confused with, you know, how things are done, right? So this is what it really looks like. Let me move this over here like this, right? So it starts off with your folder here, right? It's not a repo. When you make a folder on your operating system, it's just a folder, right? So what happens is I want to make changes, and I want to push the changes to my staging area. That's the first step. My staging area, which is the .git hidden folder, is the first thing I do. And I do that by doing, by command line, git add dot. Or in Visual Studio, I select the files that I want to push to my staging area. I'll show you that later. So my staging area is just a place to say, hey, I've got a commit happening, right? When I make a commit, it actually goes into something called a local repo. It actually puts it inside this .git folder, right? Actually, so what it really should look like is like this. Staging area .git, all right? So the staging area is like, you, can, you don't have to put everything inside your, your repository. You don't, may, sometimes you may not want to put everything in your repository. You may only want to put some things in your repository, right? So first we start off with our local work. We put them into the staging area when we add everything. And then when we make a commit, the snapshot actually goes into your local repo. From there, when we do a push, we push from the local repo to your remote repo. That's what really happens. Okay, this is the process that we use when we do, we, when we do Git. It's happening behind the scenes a lot of times, and we don't really think about it. It's on all the time, all right? Let's look over here. So what we've done here so far is I've taken my local files and I've pushed them up to Git. But in the process, I've gone through the staging area. I'm going to show you this again when we do another change, right? Into my local repository, and then from there, push them up to GitHub. When I do a pull, right? When I do a pull, I'm actually, what I'm doing is I'm doing the same process. It's going into my Git repository, skipping my staging area, and then going into my work folder inside my Git repository all the time, right? So it's a hidden folder. And if you actually look in your folders, if I actually look at my, if I go right click here on my project, do this with me, Visual Studio 2015, 2015 people, right click. And if I go down to the bottom, it should say something like open folder and file explorer, yeah? And if I do that, if I look at my folder, you can't see a repo here, right? But what about if I go to this one? Look at this, here's my .git folder. This .git folder is my repository, all the repository information in here. If I click in there, it's actually a folder that keeps track of everything. And there's a, there's a file that's actually called head that keeps track of what the latest commit is. That's what the head file is. If you actually look in there, it's just the, the serial number of the latest commit. What does that mean, serial number of latest commit? Well, if I look online, if I look at this, my, my commits online, this is what it looks like online, I have some serial numbers over here. It looks like a hash, that's what it really is, a hash 
a unique identifier for each commit. And based on a bunch of factors, the time that you made the commit, the name of the commit, all this other stuff makes a unique hash so that every commit that's online is different than every other commit. Right? You can identify each of the snapshots. Questions so far? Local repo, remote repo. Okay, staging area. All right, so we've got this stuff, and I think this is a great place to stop. I think I've gone for about an hour now, right? So it's been from 12.30 to 1.30. Let's take a break, five, 10 minutes to do your bio break, get a smoke, talk to your girlfriend, all that kind of stuff. Boyfriends, lots of girls in the class, which I'm really happy to see, right? And come back within five or 10 minutes, and we'll do the next piece, which is test-driven development, okay? Let's do that. So let's take a break.